So Matthew chapter 15 is the issue of the, the Gentile woman who comes to Jesus. And uh, we, we read through the passage uh, last week. And uh, I think uh, just for our benefit, we shall read through it again quickly this morning. Let's uh, begin Matthew chapter 15 and verse number 21. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coasts and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat with the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee, even as thou wilt, and her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Now we're looking at this passage in the context of we've studied the dispensational distinctive of circumcision. And we saw in time past back here, we saw in great detail how the nation of Israel is the circumcision, the covenant that was made with Abraham and all of Abraham's seed and his descendants. And there's a distinction in God's program with the circumcision and the uncircumcision, the Gentile nations of the world. We've progressed through our studies, and we've come to the point where we're in the four Gospels, where John the Baptist shows up on the scene, and we've already covered him. And now we're looking at the Lord Jesus Christ's earthly ministry. And we, we're asking ourselves, is that distinction between circumcision and uncircumcision still there? Because, as you know, many people will read their Bible, and they think that in Matthew chapter 1, a great change has taken place. The Old Testament is now null and void, and everything is new and different. And we're now saved from Matthew 1, 1 forward uh, in a different program of, of, of a different gospel, of the cross of Christ and grace. But we're looking and saying, is that distinction still there? We've covered several items already. We looked at the issue that how Christ was committed to his people, how that he commissioned his twelve and told them not to go unto the Gentiles. And now we have the issue of this Gentile dog that comes to him and asks him a request. A request that we said last week was a godly request. It was a humble request, right? It was, it was a humble request in that it was not someone who was asking for wealth or who was asking for power. It was a mother who was asking a request on behalf of her daughter who was grievously vexed with a devil. And so not only do we have a, a humble request, we have it being a request for someone else, and we have it being a godly request because it's in line against the powers of Satan and against the power of evil that we remove the devil. And yet the woman was, was rebuffed. And so the twelve we saw were commissioned to go to Israel only. And the question I have is, do you think that Jesus in the Twelve's ministry is to you when it says it was not and that they should not go and give that which is holy unto the dogs? Jesus did not have Matthew 15 recorded in the scripture solely to describe this one woman. Rather, the Holy Spirit inspired Matthew to include this to teach believers of Christ's directed ministry to Israel only. So when we're asking the very question of, is this distinction still up? Here we have an example in the Gospels that is there may, partly to teach us that very fact that distinction is still there. Many Christians are unaware of the overview of the New Testament, and they have a hard time accepting the things, the harsh statements that, that Christ makes, and specifically here to this uh, woman. But this woman has exceptional faith, and she accepted the statement immediately. Look back at verse number 27. The Lord just said unto her, after this humble request from a mother, she said, truth, Lord, or I'm sorry, but he answered and said, it is not meet to take the children's bread 
Now, who that children is the nation of Israel, and cast it to dogs. And we already covered how the dogs are the Gentiles. We covered that last week. So it's not me to take what is Israel's and to give it to you Gentiles, you dogs. And look at the woman's response. She didn't just come back and say, but Lord, please, 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 please help my daughter. She responded to the Lord in faith. She said, truth, Lord. So what she did is she acknowledged Christ's ministry. She acknowledged the truth of the program that was going on. She had faith to even accept the hard statements of Christ. She was not trying to circumvent Israel's program. She was not trying to say, Lord, come down here and start working with the uncircumcision. She said, no, truth, Lord, truth. Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Lord, I'm not wanting a seat at the table. Lord, I'm not wanting you to leave your table. But can you please, just from the overflow of your table, grant my daughter this blessing from your position? So she's not trying to undo God's plan for mankind to save Israel first, and then Israel would go out and evangelize the Gentiles. She just wanted her little girl healed. And so then you come to verse 28. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. It's, that's, a, that's a contrast, is it not? From verse 23, when he answered her not a word. And verse 24, when he said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He wasn't responding to her immediately, was he? This story walks a fine line. It walks a fine line in the fact that the event reveals the determination of Christ to minister to Israel only, but it also reveals his merciful character. If Christ would have relented too soon and just healed the woman, then the revelation of God's plan would have been lost to the exercise of his mercy. But if Christ had not relented at all, then his plan of going to Israel first would have been obscured for different reasons. Because then many would stumble over his apparent lack of mercy for this woman who has a request for her daughter. And so that he would even refuse to have mercy, many would have refused to hear God's program. So even in the Old Testament, and you hopefully know this by now as we've covered it, even in the Old Testament, God would bless a Gentile coming to him in faith, such as Rahab, such as Ruth, such as uh, Nebuchadnezzar was blessed, uh, even Darius was blessed. If you turn back to uh, Daniel chapter 6, just uh, I think we've covered Rahab and uh, maybe Ruth in the past, but even someone like Darius. In Daniel chapter 6, in verse number 25. This is after Daniel, and the, he was cast into the den of lions. And the resolution from that comes in verse 25. Then King Darius wrote unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, and steadfast forever, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be even unto the end. He delivereth and rescueth, and he worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth. Wow, there's an acknowledgement, isn't it? Recognizing what God is doing in heaven and in earth, who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions, so this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. There was a, a prosperous reign of Darius at, because of the acknowledgement of who the Lord God was. There were blessings that were received from the way that he responded to God's response through Daniel. 
But if you think back to uh, Matthew chapter 15, yet none of these changes, not, not, none of this, the fact that God blesses Gentiles, that he has done that in cases, none of that changes the truth that Christ spoke unto this Gentile woman, that he was not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And this woman of great faith accepted it, accepted God's program, and had faith in, in what God was doing. And so, so should all of us, that Christ was sent not but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He was not sent except to Israel. Just three verses later in Matthew chapter 15, sorry, I should have had you hold your hand there if you're, if you're flipping back there, because we'll look at a few things. Get, Ma get Matthew chapter 15 again and get uh, Romans chapter 15. When we started looking at this section, that the disp dispensational distinctive is still there, and that Jesus' ministry was to the Jews only, we mentioned a few things in the book of, uh, in Romans chapter 15, and I want to come back and draw some of those parallels now. But in, starting in Math, Matthew chapter 15, we're looking at this issue. We have this being said. And just a few verses after this story is recorded in Matthew, after this truth is recorded in Matthew, you find in verse 31 it says, Insomuch that the multitude wondered when they saw the dumb to speak, the maimed to be whole, and the lame to walk, and the blind to see, and they glorified the God of Israel. The God of Israel. So there is still the acknowledgement that Christ came to Israel, He came to minister to Israel only, and that, he, that it's the God of Israel who they're worshiping. This is, this is not something where the barrier is broken down in Matthew chapter 1 and there's no longer this distinction. The distinction is still there. So if you think about what is going on here, Jesus' ministry is to Israel only, and that's why when the Gentile woman came to the disciples and said, my daughter is vexed with the devil, Jesus didn't even answer to her. She went to the 12 disciples and she said, help me. And the 12 asked Jesus to send her away, not to help her. Jesus said, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Mark says that the children must first be filled. And we've covered in previous lessons how that word children, you see that it applies to Israel. So Israel, the children must be first filled, the children of Israel that is. And it wasn't that Jesus didn't love the Gentiles. It was that this is the order of the Abrahamic covenant that were going to come through Abraham's seed and through them there would be a blessing. It's the order of the Abrahamic covenant. Bless Abraham. And through the circumcision, God would send salvation and the blessing of God would go to the uncircumcision through the circumcision. So we have gone over this simple truth a multitude of times in this study. As we've, we've been here, I think, since September, it's now January. And we've seen this simple truth take on form in many different ways. So what you see is that it's not just some outdated phrase from the Old Testament that the blessings were to go through Israel or that we have this covenant of circumcision and God would bless the circumcision first and through that blessing it would go out to the nations of the world. It's not some outdated phrase. The principle is alive and strong and playing itself out in the details of the pages of the New Testament. So that even when you come across this story about the Gentile woman and you see the response, you understand that the reason for this response is based upon God's covenants and promises made unto the fathers. And so when you study your Bible and you look to understand your Bible, it's not a bunch of disjointed and disconnected stories to make practical application to your life today. The Bible, God has a plan. And God has a program. And if you want to understand what's going on within the pages and the details of God's Word, you find the principles upon which God is working. And you find those principles woven throughout the details of God's Word. And it all makes sense. And it's all consistent. 
and it all comes together. So why would God refuse this woman? Well, it's quite obvious when we consider the details. In Jesus' earthly ministry, he set out with that priority to be the minister of the circumcision only. Remember that verse from Romans chapter 15? So in Matthew 15, 24, Jesus was reminding the disciples about the program of God that was in effect at the time. In, the one, in that one verse in, uh, in, in Matthew chapter 24, when he's reminding them, you notice if you look back, at, if you're still in Matthew 15, and the woman comes, she, she's saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him. Because she was bothering them, right? For she crieth after us. So the woman who's making the request is over here with the twelve apostles. And they have to leave that area and they go to where Christ is. So you see who she came to? She came to the twelve. And the twelve go to Christ and say, send her away for she crieth after us. But when he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So who was that statement being made to? It was being made to the twelve apostles, was it? It wasn't being made to the Gentile woman. He wasn't sitting there explaining to her his program. She acknowledged it later. That's the amazing thing, is that these people knew what was going on, and here we have the complete revelation of the Word of God today, and we don't even understand it, but yet these people completely understood it. But when he made that response, but he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel, he made that response to the twelve to let them know and to reconfirm in their mind and to teach them exactly what the program is. Then came she, then she came and worshipped him. So now she approaches him. So that statement there, it's important to see, I think, that you have what Christ is doing in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. His ministry is summed up in that one verse. If you want to understand what Christ's earthly ministry is about, you see in Matthew 15, 24, but he answered and said unto, unto, but he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And there is an overview of his ministry in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So we already saw, I asked you to get Romans chapter 15. We already saw, when we looked at uh, Romans chapter 15, that it demonstrated what the ministry of Christ was about when Paul recounts his ministry. Because he says in Romans chapter 15 and verse 8, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Well, doesn't that fit like a glove with Matthew chapter 15 and verse 24? But I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It sure does. It fits just like a glove. So you had the Lord Jesus Christ explaining to his 12 apostles the purpose of his ministry. And now you have Paul who is going back and who is also explaining the dispensational nature and character of Paul's ministry. A minister of the circumcision is a minister of who? Israel. The circumcision is Israel. So if he's a minister of the circumcision, it doesn't mean that he's a minister to the whole world. It means he's a minister to a specific group of people. So you see, Christ wasn't being reluctant. We're talking about this, this Gentile woman. He wasn't being reluctant, but he was simply saying, as he goes on to tell the woman, that the children of Israel have to be dealt with first. We have to get Israel right first. Because they have, they have to get the right first. And then it will go through them. The children must be filled first. That's what Mark says. They have to be filled first. And then the blessings, once they get it, then it will go out to all the nations of the world. Romans chapter 15, verse 8. And I say that Jesus Christ was the minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers and that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy 
as it is written, for this cause I will confess thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. This is what the woman cried for. She said, Lord, mercy, I need mercy, thou son of David. She acknowledges who he is. This woman knew what was going on. She acknowledged who he was, acknowledged the program, truth, Lord, but even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the master's table. I'm not asking to come up and to have a seat at Israel's table. I just want the overflow. But as the son of David, he couldn't yet grant her mercy because Israel wasn't ready to be the channel of blessing to the Gentiles. So it wasn't a quick response of yes and taking care of all of the Gentiles' needs. No, there was still a wall up. There was still a buffer that was in place. We get Israel right first and Israel will go out to be the blessing. But notice how the mercy will come. If you look at Romans chapter 15, verse number 9. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, For this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles, and sing unto thy name. And again he saith, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. A rejoicing with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. And again, Isaiah saith, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, and him shall the Gentiles trust. Do you see the prophetic program is laid out there by Paul? Paul lays it right out for you. The blessings of God will go to the Gentiles through Israel's rise to kingdom glory. And in Matthew 15, 24, when Christ is responding to the 12 apostles, Christ is saying, if you want to get that woman off your back, then let's get Israel right and let's get the program going in the right direction. Let's, Israel has to get right first. That's the principle. In Matthew 15, that middle wall of partition is still up. So when we're asking the question, is it still up in, under David? Yes, it is. Was it still up under John? Yes, it is. Is it still up under Christ? Yes, it's still there. The middle wall is still there. Verse 24 of Matthew 15 showed that the middle wall is still there. I'm not sent but unto Israel. Is that a distinction between Israel and the nations of the world? It absolutely is a distinction because he says, I'm only going to the one group. Verses 27 and 28 show how the woman understood that the wall is still up and that the blessings belong to Israel, even though that she's on the wrong side. So she put herself into subjection to Israel, believing God's position for her, and it was not until she did that that she received anything. It was not until she responded in faith of what God was doing that she received the blessing. But she approached God in that faith, understanding what the program was, saying, I just want the overflow from the table, from Israel's table. You know, Israel sat at that table, and the table became a snare. But the wall is still up. The wall is still up. And most of Christianity today is operating in unbelief of Matthew 15 and Romans 15. Unbelief of what God is doing, unlike the woman who did believe. So now let's turn our attention to the, uh, the centurion. Look at Luke chapter number 7. So if we move on from the Gentile dog example, and now we're still under this issue that Jesus' ministry was to the Jews only, and I'm trying to uh, point out and, 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 and back this up. And if we look at Luke chapter 7, and let's begin reading in, uh, let's start in verse 1. Now when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum, and a certain centurion's servant, who was dear unto him, was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, that's the Jews, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. So is this centurion man, is this a, is this a Gentile or is this a Jew? It's a Gentile. 
But the, the, Jew, the, the elders of the Jews are saying in verse 5, For he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou wouldest enter under my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say unto one, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. And then Jesus heard these things. He marveled at him, and turned him about. So now he's turning and he's facing Israel. And said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And they that were sent, returning to the house, found the servant whole that had been sick. This Gentile would not even approach Jesus. In verse 7 he said, Neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee. This Gentile had some understanding he had some understanding because how did he approach Jesus? Verse number three. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him, the centurion sent unto Jesus, the elders of the Jews. <laughs> this centurion has more understanding than Christianity today. Because when he wanted to approach God in God's program to the nation of Israel, he sent the Jews the ones to whom Jesus was ministering to, to try to get a blessing from him. Rather than approaching Jesus himself, he went through Christ's way, through whom Christ was ministering to. What's interesting in that word, there's a word there where it says that, um, and when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly. A besought. There, there's a a beseeching there. And that word normally occurs against some type of resistance. So you know how he resisted the Gentile woman and he didn't answer, he didn't answer a word unto the twelve and he said, I'm not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So he rebuffed her initial request for a blessing. It appears to me in this passage that there's a beseeching. Normally that occurs against some, res some resistance. If you look it up, that word, it has a connotation to ask with urgency in a manner where you are pleading, imploring, or begging. And I guess you could take it one of two ways. Either these Jews really loved this centurion and they just came and, and were just pleading and begging immediately, or maybe there's some resistance on Christ's part. You're coming to me about a Gentile? And they beseech him, they're pleading with him, they're imploring him, they're begging him. Jesus typically resisted a Gentile's overture. But again, this centurion wisely sent the, uh, the elders of Jew, the Jews to him. So Israelites pleaded with Jesus to help a Gentile. So just as Jesus resisted the Canaanite woman, it appears he hesitates here. And again, this reinforces the foundation in Israel. Before building any further, it, it shows the Lord's compassion without neglecting what his ministry is to Israel only. And like the Canaanite woman who said just the right thing to convince Jesus, truth, Lord, yet even me, a Gentile dog who's not at your table, can just receive the crumbs. Even in that way, the centurion said just the right thing, that he said he, he approached Jesus in faith, he says, I didn't think myself worthy to come unto thee, verse 7. But all you have to do, Jesus, is say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. He didn't say, Lord, if you, maybe my servant will be healed. He said, he acknowledged that Jesus didn't even have to come in unto his servant. Now that's a man that understands the power of Christ and what Christ is doing. That's a man who has faith in who Christ is and what he's able to do. Because Christ from afar off, he sends, he sends his person. 
Then Jesus went from them, uh, verse 6, Jesus was coming with the Jews, that they're on their way to the centurion's house. And when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him. So he sent friends out from the house, sent them out to where Jesus is. You don't even have to come any further. Saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself. Don't trouble yourself. I'm not worthy. Don't trouble yourself, for I'm not worthy that thou shouldest enter in under my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, just speak the word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man set under authority. Huh. I'm a centurion. I'm a man set under authority. I have authority in this army, and I have men under me. You know what he just acknowledged there? That Christ came with authority. That here you are, I also am a man set under authority. I acknowledge that you have authority. And all I have to do to the soldiers unto me is I say unto one, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh, and to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. And what he was implying is, Lord, all you have to do is speak the word, and my servant will be healed. This is a man approaching Jesus with great faith. And Christ responds and says, when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him marveled at him and turned him about. He marvels at this centurion's friends that comes to him and the statements made from this man and he turns about to the Jews that were following him and he's getting ready to make an example of the faith of this Gentile and here Israel is coming seeking faith in Israel and I find none. You know the tree, the fig tree, why cumbereth it the ground? I come searching fruit and I find none. And he turns around to these Jews that are coming with them. And he said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. So, we've covered a couple of examples this morning of Gentiles approaching Jesus. People from the other side of the middle wall of partition approaching Jesus during his earthly ministry when he's ministering to Israel only. And the response is what? Not that the Gentiles, not that the uncircumcision is just like Israel and is a part of Israel's program. No, they are different. And even in God's mercy and having mercy unto these Gentiles, he still demonstrates his purpose in ministry, that I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. We'll end there today, and uh, as we move forward, I'm hoping, uh, I think next week, we'll finish up uh, Christ's earthly ministry, and boy, things are really going to start to get interesting. We're going to start to move into Acts, the Acts period, we're going to have some contention, and we're really going to see this issue of the circumcision and the uncircumcision come to a boiling point, and things are going to get very interesting, my friend. So I hope you'll continue to join us. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your great mercy unto us, Lord. As we've seen this morning in, in your word, that you are a merciful God. And we know that you've been merciful to us today in the dispensation of grace by sending your Son to die for our sins, offering us salvation freely on the basis of grace. Thank you for that offer, Lord. May we not take it for granted, and may we live a life in thankful gratitude for, to you for what you've done for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.